a YouTube ad? Yeah, go ahead. You're live now. Hi, folks. Welcome. End of November. Thanksgiving weekend for the Americans. Hope you all had lots of turkey. I was going to say, and all the family you could stand. I meant to say, lots of family and all the turkey you could stand. This is our YouTube Live to raise funds for our Purple Heart Project, which, by the way, starts in April. And what else can I tell you about it? It's a great program. We treat 42 combat wounded veterans each year. They come in from all over the world. We bring them in for a six-day hand tool workshop. So we imagine learning how to build a piece of furniture 200 years ago. That's what we would do. In fact, I'm going to show you a few, couple of things that uh, we're going to be doing this coming year. Uh, Frick's behind the camera. Uh, Jake's behind the camera. Frick is on the Frick cam. I think Ken may be on. Is Luther on? Luther's on. Don't know who else. Anyway, if your combat wounded vet has been to one of our classes, by all means, please shout out. Do uh, oh, Ken's not here. Dang it! How are we going to do that, Jake? I'll do it. Okay, just put in uh, at <coughs> Jake, and then your name and what class you were in. Frick, you ready? You got a cloud question for me? Topic uh, is hand saws, apparently. Back saws. Peter Rosa in Oceanside, California, says, "Are Connor Bedard saws as good as your hand saws?" <laughs> Are Connor, Bedard, Connor Bedard's hands as good as my hands? Give him a few years. Well, that's a funny joke. So if you don't know who Connor Bedard is, he's the, uh, the latest and greatest in the world of hockey. He's only five foot seven, eight, eight, but he's a dynamo. 18 years old, playing in a professional league amongst the best in the world, and, and uh, not only holding his own, but... Uh, Helping the team, pretty amazing. I don't, I play, I don't watch, but I catch the highlights, and he's a highlight reel in and of himself. Oh, love, before we get started, Jake, can you take the camera and move around a little bit? Just a sec. I, I want to show you what we're doing in the shop, and while I'm waiting for Jake, we'll do another question. Uh, right. Dan Patton in Fall River, Nova Scotia. Hey, Dan. Fall it, River, not far away. Is there anything a Japanese-style saw could do that a Western saw cannot do? So, actually, I have some. Where are they, Jake? They're sitting right here somewhere. So, here's a couple of uh, Japanese saws, if you're not familiar with them. They're designed to cut on the pole. And Western saws are designed to cut on the push. I'll show you what I mean. Give you a little demo. Um, you might need that piece of wood. I'm going to grab, oh, I've got a piece of pine there, and I'm going to grab a piece of uh, maple or something hard that I can find right off the bat. Here's a piece of walnut. That'll do. So the, uh, the, what attracts people to Japanese saws is the fact that they cut on the pull stroke. So here's the Japanese dovetail saw. Uh, first thing is I really don't like the handle. I just find that, especially as you get older, wasn't, wasn't bad when I was, when I bought this one, it had the biscuit. When I bought that in um, probably 1985, how old was I? 30, 24. 85, how old was I? Oh, wow, 24. Okay. Had no problem gripping something like that. Now I'm 62, and it's not nearly as comfortable. A bit of arthritis in the hands. So right off the bat, don't like, I, don't like that, I don't like that grip. Um, and I may not be doing it properly, but if I'm not doing it properly, then it's not intuitive. So there's my saw. There's a grip that fills your hand, an adult male hand. It's got some little finger recesses, so... Pick it up in a dark room, you're going to hold it the exact same way every time, and you'll always know where the blade is pointing based on how it feels in your hand. Not so with this. So here's a piece of, uh, looks like 11 sixteenths. 11 sixteenths inch thick walnut. So the idea is that it's easier to start because instead of pushing, you're pulling. 
but oh, I really don't like this. This is brand new, by the way. So we'll do a little test. We'll do a little speed of cut. And I'll try to be, uh, well, here's, there's, a, there's a gauge line on there already. I got to have one on the back side. I'll try to be as fair as possible, meaning control my bias. So there's a line. Count how many strokes it takes us to get down to the line. But, what? Well, I would just say that you'd probably start it closer to the heel than the toe. Okay, I'll start at the heel. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve. Now this one. That goes straight, fairly straight. One, two, three, four. Half. And I wasn't, I, that's, my, if I was in here cutting dovetails, that's how I would cut. Luther's telling me that you should use, that you should hold a Japanese saw with two hands, not one. He's crazy. That's why he's answering questions on there and not here. You don't hold it with two hands. You hold it with two hands. You hold it with one hand. You have your other hand over here anchoring your saw so you can get it started accurately. You started the segment by saying maybe I'm holding it wrong. Yeah, well, I'm not holding it wrong. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I was just doing that to be polite. So... Is that, um, a, is that a rip or a crosscut, that Japanese saw? Well, they make both teeth. This one is, but this is, this is not designed for dovetails. If, here's one that they was made specifically, supposedly, for Western hardwoods. Now, I can't even attempt to cut with that because it's missing teeth, and it's been around a long time. So if I try to use this... Yeah, I'd be there for all night. I think they, I th assume that they're using somewhat of a combination tooth. I'll put my, I'll put my uh, magnifiers on and see if I can tell if that tooth is. Yeah. It's too tiny. I can't. I can't really see well enough to tell. Don't know. Anyway, my uh, my approach to this is Japanese saws, Japanese wood, Western saws, Western wood. If you want something that's going to cut really well in our hardwoods, meaning North American hardwoods or softwoods, get a Western style saw. <laughs> With minimal set. That's why it has the brass back. What was the question, by the way? We're drifting. The question was, is there anything a Japanese-style saw can do that a Western saw cannot? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. Not in, not in our woods, anyway. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try this pine... That that is not a comfortable. Just try it with your hands, sweet. Yeah, I can tell you right now that the average guy learning to do this is not going to use two hands on the saw. The whole purpose behind one-handed saw is you create an anchor, a solid anchor point, with the opposite hand. You press the saw laterally against it. And by doing that, you can position the saw exactly where you want. So if I've got a line right here, I want to cut on the left side of the line. I come in here, pinch with the index finger and thumb, press the saw laterally, and now I can fine-tune that by moving my fingers like this, always pressing this way with the uh, right hand, in this case, get exactly where I want, anchor it, and I can make that cut as precise as I need. All right, so 
Would I recommend Japanese sauce? No, I have one because every once in a while there's something that I, I, I'm trying. Actually, now back to the question. What did, what did we use this for one time? Oh, I know. I like use it for, for cutting veneer. But that's primarily because there's a radius on there. So if I'm going in and I want to cut veneer real quick, they, they make a veneer saw that is similar. It's radius. I can go in there, lay a straight edge on there. And in that case, it's actually easier to, it is easier to pull than to push because of the thin wood. You can pull a blade of grass between your fingers. You can't push it through. So under those circumstances, yeah, but for uh, joinery, absolutely the Western style saw. Good question. Next one. Oh, here, let me see. I want to show you what we're doing. Just so, oh, come on. All right, go ahead, Frick. Uh, next one's from Dan in Ireland. Dan in Ireland? Yeah, he says, do you have Dan any Dan? plans to produce a saw set since there are no quality ones? Yeah, we... Um, we have hopes. We have hopes. We have a guy, Chris Davenport, who's a good friend and a supporter, and he's our uh, go-to engineer. And uh, he's working on lots of stuff for us, and that's one of them we'd like to be able to... And, and uh, we're going to make it easy because it'll only have uh, a couple of settings for, since we use very minimal set on our saws. So it should, uh, it should make it a little bit simpler. Uh, Kyle said you're supposed to use two hands and a foot. <laughs> oh, that's what was missing. Leave John, the new John in the chat says you're supposed to put your index finger on the top. Index finger on the top like this. Yeah, yeah. Either way, not comfortable. I don't like it, but that's just me. Next, Rick. Uh, you answered the... Okay, so next one's from Mike Evans in Knoxville, Tennessee. Hey, Mike. In Knoxville? Yeah. Why I, do I many... taught there once. Why do many manufacturers... Oh, I'm sorry. Knoxville, I taught there a lot of times. I was thinking Chattanooga. <coughs> you ready? Well, just a second. Next time you go into the Woodcraft, say hello to Everett for me. Or George. George retired, but he may still be hanging around. Now, go ahead, Frick. George Barber's a good friend of hers. Yeah, but George is retired. Okay, the question is, why do many manufacturers push cross-cut filed dovetail saws? Uh, ignorance. Just plain ignorance. So I'll tell you, uh, I'll elaborate on that story a little bit. When I uh, first started this journey in the early 1980s, um, there was no internet, obviously. Everything was mail order catalogs. And uh, you couldn't, I couldn't buy anything decent quality locally. So I tried to, I ordered every dovetail saw I ever saw in a catalog that looked like a decent saw. And they'd always show up with crosscut teeth. And I never claimed to be the, uh, the brightest bulb in the tree. But when you're cutting dovetails, you're ripping. Doesn't matter how many rip cuts you make there's only ever two cross cuts out here on the half pins everything else is a rip so why would you put cross cut tees in a dovetail saw it makes no sense whatsoever it makes for a very slow cut so i can only chalk that up to ignorance and i have some experience with a well-known tool company and the owner of that company has never cut dovetails in his life so and uh, makes saws and everything else so there's there's uh there's not a whole lot of people out there making tools, I'm sure there are some, that have a ton of experience in actually using the tools. So take that for what it's worth. I, I would rather buy a tool from somebody that actually does the work because they know, they know how to evaluate the tool. I think that's, that's a simple, we got, <coughs> we got, I got, I got uh, drug into this. I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit on that story. I was representing Lee Nelson, traveling the country from coast to coast, demonstrating, selling and demonstrating at the same time because we would do the wood show circuit. And uh, come to find out that the people who were buying the tools really didn't know how to use them. They were just getting into it. And where do you go for wood hand tool training? So, and that was before uh, YouTube. Um, so then I started, I started teaching a lot. And what I would do is I would go to one city, and the wood show would run Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then I would stay in that city Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and rent a high school wood shop and teach classes. And then I would move to the next city, and I would just repeat that process. 
So I gained a whole lot of experience teaching the people who were actually buying the tools. And what I found out was that uh, you're 55 years old and you live anywhere near the uh, 49th parallel. You've got, we got a bit of arthritis in your hand. And they couldn't grip, they couldn't, they couldn't make adjustments on tools that had little tiny adjustment knobs. They looked cute, but they were, not, they were terribly ineffective. The hand plane issue was a really big one. You get somebody who's in his 60s or 70s and he tries to adjust a regular adjustment knob on a hand plane. You got to stop and use two fingers to do it. Terribly uncomfortable. We came up with the adjuster, which allows you to do it with one finger and you don't even think about it. It just becomes automatic. So because uh, I couldn't get anybody to pay attention to what I was saying in those terms, we started making our own tools and we built it around that. The dovetail saw that came out was the first thing we made and had the little tiny teeth up front so you could start it easier and you had a chance. If you can't start it where you want, then you're going to carve the whole thing out with a chisel because your cut's in the wrong spot. So you have to be able to start it. I don't care if it cuts fast or slow. You've got to be able to start it accurately. And nobody was paying attention to that. They were copying saws. They were good saws, but they were good saws in the hand of an apprentice who just spent five years learning how to do it with a butter knife. Could do it with any tool. You got to take somebody that's in the, in the uh, last chapter of their life and they're uh, doing it as a starting it <coughs> um, from scratch. Very difficult. I was looking over here at something else I was going to mention. And it left me. So... What was the question, Frick? I should get you to repeat the question like two or three times when I'm talking. I um, stay on track. How many manufacturers push cross-cut file dovetail oh. saws? Yeah, uh, it baffles me. Baffles All right, me, I'm on the camera. Oh, so before we do this, let, let me just show you what we're doing. So here's our. Uh, you could be, should be getting excited about this. Here's our tool cabinet. You got to come around this side. So what have we done since we last, did you guys, did, I don't know if they saw the back. Coming. We got the back done. So we took a piece of quarter inch Baltic birch and we ran it through the thickness sander and the planer and we took about uh, 16th off, 16th off. And then we took two pieces of walnut veneer, actually three, wasn't it? No, yeah, it was, yeah, three. It was three. We have a center. Side. Three pieces of walnut veneer glued them together with, with veneer tape, glued it on there, put it in the vacuum press, and put the back in place. But it was a lot of work because after the veneer, after we veneered that piece of plywood, it was a bowl. And uh, how are we going to get it to fill these, to go in tight to there when it's shaped like this and like that? So I ended up putting a piece in the back, a piece of one-inch MDF that was sitting right on the edge of the rabbit, so when we put this in, it would lay flat and push out to the sides anyway. We got it in place and it turned out beautifully. So that's, and uh, the reason I didn't just, or the reason we went with Baltic birch is because we wanted it to be nice and bright on the inside. That way when you look in there, it's, you're not looking into a dark abyss and you'll be able to find the tool you're looking for. So that one's done. We finished off the drawers. Got the stops in place, got them fitting just the way we wanted. So these are all done. Actually, finally got around to putting that drawer bottom in. Yes, I did. Uh, now we're working on this one. So this is the section that's going to have the chisels. You wouldn't believe the amount of work involved in that little piece. We have a spline out here. I'll take it apart so you can see. I haven't glued it in place yet. So there's a, there's a little spline on either side, and that fits in there. And then we cut these out. And I didn't want to leave the hole from the drill, so I, I put a, uh, what is it? Core half box? Inch? Half inch? I thought it was three quarter. I don't think so. Oh, we'll go over and look. May, it might be a three quarter core box bit. Put it in the drill press and just, haul, and, and just bottom these out so when the chisel sits in there, it'll lay in tight against this. It looks nice and neat. You know what? I was thinking we couldn't glue that. We can glue that. That's running the same width, same direction. Now we got to put the piece up on the top. And we're, we're essentially following this. So we'll get this section done and then we'll move over and do the other ones. And then we'll fill it up with tools on some, uh, we'll auction or we'll have a fundraiser some night where everybody that wants to can 
can donate one of the tools, and then when it's filled, we will figure out how we're going to sell it off and use those funds towards our Purple Heart project. Okay, Frick, next. Uh, Mark Santinon, Sant Santinon. Hi, Mark. In Adelaide, Australia. And Adelaide. <coughs> so what is it? Is it is um, probably twenty five after nine down there in the morning tomorrow. Go ahead, Frick. Did I interrupt you? Yes, you did again. What is the technique for starting a dovetail saw with starter teeth like yours? Wonderful question. So, you want to start it accurately. So I'm going to draw a line on here. So there's my line. And we'll do two so that you can do both sides. And I'm going to give you a little lesson on positioning that line. That line must be plumb, uh, pardon me, square, to the end. I want my board sitting down low so it doesn't vibrate, and I want the board standing plumb. That becomes my standard. Everything I do is based off a of board standing plumb, so I will eventually learn 0, 10, and 10. And once you get there, this becomes a real simple process. So the first two inches have 22 teeth per inch. The balance has 15 teeth per inch. The uh, 22 teeth per... Well, well these... Uh, sorry... Can you call them, Frick, and just tell them we're in the middle of... Who is it? Chloe. Sorry about that. My daughter, youngest. These teeth, which do the majority of the cutting, have a zero-degree cutting face. So if you were to put a square on the face of that tooth, it would, it would be at that angle. Very aggressive, cuts fast. These teeth, however, are laid back. Instead of at that angle, they're back at about like that angle which means they have a tendency to just ride over the wood, which is exactly what you want. So what I have to do is I have to get the kerf started so that it'll hold the bigger teeth as I approach them. So I position the wood by pinching with my index finger and thumb of my opposite hand. I position it so that, I'll try to show you a little indent on my finger. I use the bottom quarter of my digit, digits, so that when I'm pressing the saw against my fingertips, you'll notice that the bump here and the bump there stays up above the set of the teeth. you got to remember, these teeth are pointing out. Each, every other tooth is pointing in the opposite direction. So that means if you hold your finger right like that, you're going to cut yourself. So press like that. Push laterally. So I'm always pushing like this, and at the same time, I'm pushing back with this hand until when I look down there. Now I'm going to show you some bad examples. That is not correct. You see wood and pencil line on this side, closest to me and none on the opposite. You don't want to be like this because I see ink or pen line, pencil line on the far side. I've crossed it on the closer side. You want and you don't want to be like this. The reason you don't want to be like that is that leaves you a gap that you have to guess. I have to guess if my saw is parallel to that line by guessing across that distance. Instead, if I move over to here so that all I have is pen, pencil line, now I can tell quite readily that I am parallel. I'm going to just use a couple of little short strokes. Forward and back. You don't have to start like this. You can start by pushing forward. And it's just a very, very light grip on the saw. Now, I'll also mention something else. Jake, if you want to come around sideways, or side on this way. What I want to show you is something I, I uh, picked up on a few years ago. I just happened to be watching a student from this angle that you're going to view it. So if I start my saw like this, I have the weight of the saw and any downward pressure, and most people apply downward pressure, divided over maybe two teeth. So there's a lot of pressure on two teeth, which tends to make it hard to start. If I lay the saw down like that, I now spread the same amount of weight over, what, 10, 15 teeth maybe, which means there's, it's much easier to start like this than it is up like that. You may find that. Once you've gained control over this, you can start any way you want. But when you're beginning, you need all the advantages. So that's how we do it when we're cutting to my left side of the line. Going to the right side of the line, I'm going to ask Jake to get over here. 
Now we're going to cut like this, sloping from the right side down on an angle closer to me. If I put my fingers like I just did, I obscure the line, can't see it. So what I have to do is pull this thumb back. I kind of move this finger out a little bit, but I help to anchor it, this finger to the board with this thumb. And actually, you can, if you can curl your finger around a little bit more, instead of running off of your skin, you can run off of your nail, which makes it even glide easier. Some people have really sticky skin and it drags on the saw blade. I'm going to do essentially the same thing. I'm going to press laterally. I'm going to move this in until I allow it to get right where I want so that as I look down, I only see pencil line. Same two little wiggles. And then when you get started, use the entire blade, which means your saw sharpening will last longer and you'll end up with a nice clean kerf with very few strokes. Thanks for that wonderfully timed question. What a great way to sell a saw, which are 15% off until tomorrow night at uh, midnight Pacific time. We have a sale going on, our Boxing Day sale. I forgot to mention that. Black Friday. Black Friday. Everything's, everything's on sale 15% except for gift certificates. And workshops. And workshops. But which workshops, are sold out. And workshops are all sold out. Which, by the way, we, uh, last year we released 42 spots. For the 2023 season, and it took 15 days. This year, we released 42 spots for the 2024 season, and it took less than six days. So, good to see. Next, Frick. <clears throat> uh, Tim Beach. Hi, Tim. Uh, what are the minimum back saw? What are the... Luther edited these a bit. What are the minimum back saw a new hand tool woodworker should start with? What are the minimum back saws a new hand tool woodworker? I'll, I'll, I'll lay them down here in order. And I'm going to include our panel saws. We now have nine different saws. So if you're building furniture with some hand tool work or all hand tool work, this would be your first purchase, a dovetail saw. You can use it for cutting small tenons on a mortise and tenon joint. Obviously, it's designed for the dovetail. Second saw I would get, I'm going to go over here and use these, would be a joinery cross cut. And this is the same frame. I, do the, I use the same handle on everything. So that, I mean, it just stands to reason Every saw you pick up, you're reinforcing this me muscle memory, and you'll just get better with all your saws, with practice on with any of them. This is 15 teeth per inch. Secret to it is very minimal set, just two thousandths of an inch per side. For those who don't know what two thousandths represents, take a piece of writing paper and split it in half. Writing paper is approximately four thousandths of an inch, so very, very small amount of set. What that does is it makes for a nice smooth cut and it also cut, makes a narrow, narrow, narrow curve. A narrow curve allows the saw to track. You think about it. If the curve is really narrow, just the width of the blade, then as you're sawing, the sides of the curve are rubbing on the sides of the blade and they don't allow it to drift to the left or drift to the right. It has to continue on that chosen path. First saw, second saw. Third saw would be the medium tenon. So this is a saw we designed, I don't know how many years ago, and uh, we designed it because um, the average person, the average woodworker today, probably doesn't cut mortise and tenons a lot. So a full-size tenon takes some getting used to. You've got to develop the, the wrist strength to control it and handle it. And uh, I would figure that probably 90% of the tenons you're going to cut, you could do with this one. So we made this saw a little shorter. We made it a little lighter, by, and it doesn't have quite as much depth of cut. But again, same handle. Um, the, the back is a little bit uh, wider. This is 7 eighths of an inch wide. This is 1 inch wide. So it's got some heft to it, but it cuts really nice. Same concept, little teeth on the front, 22 teeth per inch, negative rate cutting angle. And then 12 teeth per inch. Now, actually, we did something a little different here, too. 12 teeth per inch are a little bit bigger. They're going to be a little more aggressive. So what we did is we backed off 
the cutting face. Instead of a zero degree cutting face, remember I, I put the saw blade on like that, the square on like that, and that represents the cutting face. We're back about, oh, five or six degrees, which just makes it a little bit easier to get started. And it's all about control. So that's number three. Um, I would actually say, and, and this comes into play because, especially if you're in a small shop and you've got to break down your material, a piece of plywood. It's hard to handle sometimes one person. You can actually go in and break it down. I would suggest that your cross-cut saw, a good uh, um, cross-cut panel saw, which allows you to make a nice smooth cut. Again, very narrow set, just three thousandths of an inch per side. I would probably make that as my number four. Uh, I'm going to pull out the, uh, we call this our, um, what do we call this, Jake? I can't even remember. Bench cross cut. So this is the same frame as the medium tenon, only it has a cross cut tooth. Now it's also got a thicker blade. I neglected to mention that. These blades are 20 thousandths of an inch in thickness. These are 25 thou. A little stiffer because you've got a little more capacity here. So small miter box or just cross-cutting something, instead of using your join, joinery cross-cut saw, save that for joinery, use something like that. So that would be, and you can, I mean, I'm just gonna take you all the way through, but first and foremost would be dovetail, joinery cross-cut, medium tenon, um, cross panel cut, panel saw cross-cut, um, bench cross-cut, I don't have it here, it's in the other shop. And the full tenon? Yeah, the full tenon. But I would probably put this in next, which is a rip. Full tenon's right here. A rip saw. That's where it is. So this is the same size, same as this, only you're using, you're dealing with a rip tooth instead of a, uh, instead of a cross cut. Then you have your full size tenon. So that gives you considerably more capacity and depth. Well, I should be comparing it to that one. It's a little bit longer, a little bit heavier. That's a custom handle. It comes with a regular handle. And then we, we introduce these. Jake, do you know where the, the dovetail version is? Right here. Now, if you end up doing a lot of small work, um, yeah, over here. If you do a lot of jewelry box stuff, I was cutting dovetails in something once. So you look at the size of those. And my saw, my dovetail saw, was actually making the wood bend. And I thought, oh, I wish I had something a little bit smaller. A friend of mine, John Robishaw, his dad uh, fought all the way through World War II, wounded numerous times, but survived the war. And he had given John a little, cute little dovetail saw. And I just thought it was the neatest thing. It's actually out there on the wall. John's going to come get it someday. So I kind of use that as the theme or the inspiration. And we actually call this saw the Len Robishaw three-quarter saw. And his name is Leonard Robishaw. And that's a big salute to uh, our World War II vets. Don't have a lot of them left. I know Jack. Jack Hughes was a World War II vet, and he was actually here in our class last year. So I would put the, the three-quarter dovetail and the three-quarter crosscut at the end of the line only because a bit of duplication here, but if you're dealing with small stuff, it's really handy. And you really appreciate it when you start making little tiny dovetails like that. Next, Rick. Uh, <clears throat> um, is there a template available to make... This is from Jason in Ohio. Hey, Jason. Is there a template available to make my own custom handles for my Rob Cosman saws? Uh, a template? You can't take the handle off, can you? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can, you can take the handle <laughs> off. We don't have a template. Huh? We don't have a template. Um, <clears throat> when I designed these, I just played around and played around until it felt good. And I suppose, I mean, you could trace the saw that you obviously, if you want the same handle, you just trace that. It's just going to be a little bit awkward trying to trace the curve. But if you used a, took a pencil, I've done that before, and, and ground a, uh, you know, let me do it so I can, you know exactly what I mean. I got glasses here somewhere. 
if you took a pencil and your shooting board, I'll use the little one. And then cut your cut your pencil back. with a real long taper like that. Then you could come in and you can actually follow that curve. You gotta keep it standing upright and trace it down below. And then you'll actually get the line will be right below where the contact point of that is, right? If you use the pencil in the regular way, then your line's gonna be your line is going to be considerably away from the outside profile of the radio of the curve. All right, next, Rick. Do you want the vents? Yeah. Who are we talking to? So these are. Uh, speaking of veterans, these are guys and gals possibly that have been to our class as part of our scholarship program, which is what we're raising funds for. And they're going to tell us their name and which class they were in. Go ahead. It's always a test of my memory. How many you got? Thirteen. Brent Nelson. Brent. This would be Brent, owner of the slowest, but one of the best dovetails ever. Are you working on the speed, Brent? I know. Next. Brent was in, uh, let me guess, Brent was in September? Yeah. September class this year? Um, Kyle, but he's a half hour ahead of us. Kyle Parallel yeah. over in Newfoundland. What can I say about Kyle? Kyle and Jesse Rufange were the first two Canadian soldiers that we had in our program. Kyle's a great guy. Kyle comes over here and works as my assistant numerous times. Awesome dude. Also a bench brigade member, built the bench for air, built the bench and delivered it. What was it a nine hour drive? Yeah. Each way to Eric Haller, Hallermerson. I say that right? Hallermerson, <coughs> close enough. He was in another part of Newfoundland. Who else? Uh, JB and Fredericton. Yeah, JB. JB was here in September as well. October. Uh, September October. Know. September. G September. 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 Uh, hey, JB. JB's got, I think, 32, 30? 33. 33 years. Canadian Army. Jonathan Sidney. Jonathan Sidney. I don't know any Jonathan Sidneys. I know a Sid. So Sid is 32 years Canadian Army uh, engineers, and Sid works here. He's, uh, he's one of our guys. He actually uh, runs our CNC machine, too, for us. Up in Fredericktown. He's been away. Is he over in, is he over in uh, Cape Breton? Didn't, didn't show up for work this week. Justin Doherty's on. Justin Doherty. Oh, Justin. Uh, October. Yeah, right. How did Justin? Same class, Patrick Glynn. Pat? Yeah, I just saw, I just saw Pat's picture in the, on the uh, Facebook page with the receiving his bench. Uh, Jeffy. Jeffy O'Connor. Er, er. Would that be the one? Jeffrey, brother, and Kim, right beside him. Check out Kim's, Kim. If you're ever in, uh, in uh, Virginia Beach, Kim has a little storefront in a place called The Painted Tree. Go and check out her stuff. Really impressive. And Jeff's is too. Tony Payne is on too. Tony, down in Australia, one of the two diggers that we've had. Hey, Tony. He had a long, he had a, he flew home from here and a huge long drive once he landed down there. What a, that was a, probably the longest trek for any vet that's come to our program. We only, have, we only get Tonys out of Australia. Who else? Uh, Kev. 
Devin Burris? Devin Burris. 20, 22 years. Army. Attached to the Special Forces, EOD. Explosive Ordnance Disposal. Kev's the uh, master of the... Uh, Master of the uh, Laser Engraver. Check out Kev's website, Burris Woodworking, B-U-R-A-S, BurrisWoodworking.com. Kev's a great guy. That's where I get all of my plaques. You'll notice, I love, I love it when it's carved on stone because it's written in stone. It lasts forever. Anybody else? Yeah, Casper. Casper, way over in, way in over Denmark. Denmark. Wow. Wow. So Casper's the only vet that we've had from, from Denmark, came over last year. Great guy, excellent craftsman. Still more active at it. I see his stuff posted on uh, Slack. Good to see you, Casper. Michael Delvoy in Wisconsin. Michael, how are you? What class, last year? Yeah, it was last year. I think it was early part of 2022. Yeah. Yeah, it was six class a year. Memory's not that good. Uh, Michael Miller in Texas. Mm, which class? Michael was in the class. Um, he was. He was in it. He was in the same class as. Uh, who's Eric Champion in Norma? Oh, Eric. Eric, yeah. So that was. Uh, I think that was. That was early part of this year. I think it was May. Hey, Mike. Michael. Eric on. May or June. Uh, Wally. Wally in Ontario, one of our Canadian vets. Hey, Wally. And Last year as well. <coughs> Jim Eakin. Jim. Jim's my Jim's my, mo my most interesting wounded vet. I mean, is, is he, Jim Goldeneye. Fascinating technology, but good guy, too. Hey, Jim. Yeah, um, honorable mentions to uh, Jamie Fagel, one of our notorious bench builders. Jamie. He's in North Carolina. I think he's yeah. made four. Four benches, Jamie. Awesome. You know why you do it, and you're blessed for doing it. And then Chris McCoy, he's the one that works for Nestle and just delivered that bench to Pat, actually. Oh, yeah? Chris, thank you. All right, Frick, next question. All right, we've got a couple from the chat. This one comes from Mark. He says, how do you cut straight? How do you cut straight? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm going to give you a whammy of a lesson. So first of all, we define straight for everybody. lots of questions to get through, so keep it simple. Okay, thank you, Frick. Ooh. We're only an hour tonight, Ooh, Frick right? Frick giving us the no, sense. No, not only an hour. No, we're two. We don't do hour, we oh. do two. Uh, Wipe that Frick. smile off your face. Frick. <laughs> straight. Wait, just a second. Just a second. Find a, find a quick question. Um, Why? Well, because this one will be 10 minutes. Ivan Tomic in the chat says, what do you look for in a premium saw? Um, RC woodworking, RC saws. If you find that, you're good. So whatever I find in here is what you want. Uh, if we're talking about a back saw, the, ha uh, the handle, there's two things that are critical. The tooth line is really the most critical, but the handle is too. Not the materials, but how it fits in your hand. So let's start with the tooth line. Set is probably the real... Whoa, pause. Jamie Fagel is at seven benches built. Oh, Jamie. Wow. Is Jamie, is Jamie the top? Uh, at seven? I Gotta can't imagine it. anyone else is up there. Well, you know, well, as an in, uh, for an individual, but the, the uh, bench... The, um, Right, yeah, that's why, that's why I said for an individual. Right, how many have they top. done? Oh, I don't know. I think they've built nine. But as an individual, Jamie, seven benches. You, you should have it, you know what, let's have Jamie come on. Let's do a little bench brigade promotion since we've got a new class, a new year coming up. Jack, if you're, is Jack on? Jack, see if we can arrange to have Jamie come on and just tell everybody why he chooses to do seven benches. Um, I'm sure he's got some stories that uh, that would uh, make it well worth listening to him. That's that's pretty incredible. Um, Mike in the chat said, "Sorry, I drained late. I don't even know what a back saw is. Can you just quickly explain that while you're going over the?" Well, I don't know what it is either, but that's what they call it. 
I, 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 I'm guessing that it has something to do with the fact that it has a back on it. This saw doesn't have a back on it. This flimsy saw doesn't have a back on it. So this saw has, they were made them out of brass or steel. The good ones are brass. It has a uh, firm or stiff brass back that allows you to use a very thin blade that would otherwise be too thin to use. It means you have a very narrow kerf, so you don't have to remove as much wood. And the brass back securely held to the blade means that it stays nice and straight and stiff and makes it easier to use. And it also gives you some downward pressure, downward weight. Okay, now I can go into sawing straight. So the first thing I want to do is define straight. And this is actually going to be a lot simpler than you probably think. Because straight cut is... Now, you know what I need him to do? I need him to qualify something. Uh, what was his name? Hello, Frick. Um, Who asked the question? Ivan Tomeic. Ivan, would you respond on the on the thing and ask? Or so no, wait, no, you you asked that question. No, no you did. Well, what do you mean we did? Oh, it's on straight. Well, then then he asked the back saw one. Jake did. No. Yeah, but we're going back to the okay. If we're going back to the what do you look for in a premium saw? Then it was no. yes. No, was no. How do you cut straight? Oh, that's just Mark. Mark, Mark, I need you to def I need you to uh, clarify something, because oftentimes people mis misinterpret this. Straight is the shortest distance between two points. So cutting straight can be at any angle. Plum, which people often say, mean, say straight, but what they really mean is plum or perpendicular to the earth. I need, you to qual I need you to make sure that I'm addressing the right issue. So if you'll just tell Frick in the chat whether or not you mean plum or if you mean straight, as you said. Next question, Frick, while we're waiting on that. Uh, Harold Olson. Hey, Harold. What is your opinion of Scandinavian-made saws? Scandinavian-made saws. Well, I um, I don't know if... Oh, he may be talking about... If you're talking about a bow saw, I made a couple bow saws. It wasn't my thing. Tay Frid used to use... Well, he used several, but he used a bow saw as well. But that's... It's not my... Not my style. Um, I... This will come into play when we talk about straight, but I like the fact that uh, the more blade you have, the straighter you're going to be able to make your cut because of the way it interacts with the kerf. Uh, a bow saw is like a bandsaw blade on a, bow, on a big frame that um, almost like a big coping saw. So not as easy to control, I don't think. You'd have to have quite a few hours of use with it in order to be able to get good at it. So if that's what you're referring to, I'm, I've, I don't even know where I put them. I made them a long time ago. Oh, yeah, well, actually, one of the vets made me one, too. We use it for get, get our Christmas tree, cutting it down. Works really well for that. Not so much a joinery saw. Let me know when, he, when Mark responds, Frick. And then meanwhile, what's the next question? Um. Tis the season to donate. Alfred, Alfred Borg. Santa How Claus on tonight? I haven't seen him. How do you sharpen your dovetail saw, especially the little teeth up front? Um, easy. And I say that. Well, it actually is. So the first thing you have to do is you have to have a vice. So, Jake, did we do this on YouTube or an online workshop? No, I think it was YouTube. So you need a vice. I don't know why there's yellow tape on this. So that when I marked on it, you could just peel it away. So uh, here's my vice. Two pieces of plywood. Um, four pieces of hardwood. Some screws and a piece of piano hinge. So I, my, I got a little bit elaborate with this. I actually cut a little recess in here. I probably used the router to do it. So that I could hold all of my saw in there. Now, the two cleats on the side main, are made so that when you put it in the vise like that, it automatically, it automatically uh, uh, remains parallel to the top of the bench. You want, 
you want your saw blade to be just up above. Remember, it's a thin blade, so you don't want it to be too far away from the support of the jaws. You uh, need an appropriate sized file. And uh, you want a good file. That's the hard part, is getting a good file. We, uh, we, we looked for good files for a long time. We finally found them. So it's a um, four or a five inch double extra slim taper file. And the problem with files you buy today is instead of that being a point, it's rounded over. So you start filing and instead of getting nice sharp teeth that look like this with a nice sharp gullet, sharp tooth, you end up getting something that looks more like this waves so these are on our site and they're not that expensive now the nice thing about a dovetail saw is it is a rip tooth so all you have to do is file perpendicular to the blade so if i put a square right there i'm going to be filing so that my file is crossing the tooth perpendicular to the run of the blade the angle of the tooth well you can set something on there like that if you want and hold it so that that tooth is going to be cutting that tooth, that side of the file is going to be cutting that side of the tooth, which is the part that's actually going to be doing, oh, sorry, I'm going to run the, I said, I did that backwards. I forgot which way this thing was sitting. Each stroke is going to be filing half of one tooth and half of the other. The cutting edge comprises of two surfaces coming together like this. So you've got to do both. So I set my, my file in there. Um, you, if you're new at this, you can take a popsicle stick, drill a hole in it, and stick the end of the file in the hole when you got your file at the right angle. And then you can tell by where the position of the popsicle stick is. Now, I, that's actually a little bit big, Jake. Where's the... That's the right shot. Huh? Let me see it. That's the right time. Yeah, I know, but I like that little one. <coughs> The little one's too small for the application. I well, I could use it on here. Just in case that's... Uh, my, my wife and daughter are coming back from a, a hockey game an hour away, and I just want to make sure that they're... All right. Um, so I put this in here. I get the, I get the face of this file standing plumb, and I just hold my finger right there like that so that I know it's always going to be in the same spot with each tooth. And then set it in there. Now, I'll, I'll address these in a moment. But if I started back here, I would push forward, and it, depending on how dull it is, I may need two passes, maybe only need one. I push forward, and I drag back. Most people don't do that. Problem is, it's hard to see. So if you're pushing forward and then lifting up and trying to set back down, I guarantee you're going to end up hitting uh, a, a tooth twice when you didn't mean to. So instead, I go forward, come back, go forward, and then with it in the gullet, I rise up and drop into the next one. And then I'll repeat the process. Rise up and drop into the next one. And do that. And it's pretty easy to guess when you're plumb. If you want, you could draw lines on there, but that doesn't seem to be necessary. Get yourself all the way to here, which is where your little teeth start. Then you're going to switch to a smaller file. Where is it? I don't have it there. It's in those drawers over there. In what drawers? These little ones? I think it's out in the other... Uh... No, I don't have them in here. Give me, give me two seconds to grab it. It's in my other... I have, I have uh, two tool cabinets, so sometimes hard to keep track of everything. What's up, Moosey? Huh? What's the matter? No. Okay, come. So there's my there's my small one. And so when I get to the little teeth, I'm I've got to do a couple of things. I'm switching files, but I'm also going to switch the angle. So the cutting face is not going to be 90 degrees or zero degrees. It's going to be laying over like that, and almost, almost with the top of the file laying, um, 
level. And then you're going to do the same thing. And I don't worry about these too much. In fact, the duller they are, the easier it is to operate the saw. But you want to keep up, you want to keep up with the uh, tooth line. So if you just sharpen these and you ignore these, sooner or later this is going to be sitting higher than this. So you got to keep them and keep them uh, at the same height. And that's it. Easy to do. Easy to make this too. And you can find it on YouTube. Yeah, what, so, okay, what, was, what did Mark say? Um, I had it here. Where'd it go? A second. Uh, how to follow a line, basically. How to follow a line? Yeah, like when you're cutting straight, following the line. Let me just see if I can. Okay, well, that, I, okay, I can address that. How do you cut a straight along, yeah, how do you cut straight along the line, how to follow a line? Okay, all right, we can address that. Okay, I got to set down, Moosey. Go over and see Frick. Take that out. So, uh, I'll, I'll approach this in a couple of ways. First thing we're going to do is talk about the equipment, because that is really critical, particularly when you're first getting started. So I'm going to address the uh, straight. We mentioned it's the distance; it's the shortest distance between two points, and your saw has to be able to cut straight on its own. How does that happen? Well, if you're ripping, you want if you're ripping wood, you want a rip tooth, which simply means that these teeth are filed perpendicular to the run of the blade, so it's just like a whole bunch of little chisels all lined up, and the set has to be very minimal. So the set has to be there. If it wasn't, the blade would bind. If the teeth were, had no set on them and they literally cut 20 thousandths of an inch, this is 20 thousandths of an inch back here, you'd only get in there an eighth of an inch and it'll bind on you. So by having the teeth bent, which means if the first tooth is bent to the right, the next one is bent to the left. And that's a measured bend. It's got to be the same. And on my case, it's only it deviates from the side of the saw plate by just two thousandths of an inch. So the thickness of a sheet of paper overall. If you do that, once you start cutting, you get about that far and that takes over. Now that's providing you don't overpower by grist, grabbing the saw handle too, too firmly. If you let the, I, when I saw, I'm literally holding that, I'm just preventing it from falling on the floor. I'm allowing this part of the saw to push into, or I'm pushing, this part, on this part of the saw with the web between my index finger and my thumb. And I let the saw steer itself once I get started. I'm gonna show you why that's important. I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna slice this piece off. I'm gonna go down as far as I can. And then I'll, I'll take it out and turn it over. I'll cut this off. So how does straight correlate with flat? Well. The straighter your cut, young man, the straighter your cut, look at me, look at me, the straighter your cut, the flatter the surface, okay? So you want that surface to be really flat, and you want that surface to be really flat. So when you put the two together, you see how it makes a nice tight joint? So if you had the side of your pin going up against the side of your tail, you could be confident you're getting good glue surface. Straighter it is, smoother it is. Less set, smoother it is. If there's a lot of set, it rakes the side of that and leaves a real mess. Okay, so you want that to be nice and smooth. You can have that piece. Okay, so we got our equipment straightened out. Now, how do we actually follow the line? Well, a couple of ways. We'll draw, put a mark on here. Uh, give me an example of what line this would be. So this is going to be, well, okay, well, then I'll actually draw it like that. This is going to be, uh, well, you know what? It gets even easier than that. I'm, gonna, I'm going to do it as it pertains to uh, my method of cutting dovetails. So let's, uh, let's take this. I got the shooting board set up here, didn't I? No, you had the little one. I'm just going to clean this up. Oh, I got that blade.
played him too far. That's close enough. Okay. So we're going to do tails first. We'll get our dovetail marker, thanks to Jesse Rufian, who does a beautiful job on these. This way. So, when you're cutting dovetails, these cuts are critical. If they're off plumb, if they're off square, joint's not going to work. So you got to be you got to be really precise here. So what I'm going to do, I'm, yes. and you oh, stand over here, please. Two lines to pull. Make sure you explain both. Yeah. So I'm not worrying, I'm not going to worry about the angled cut. There will come a time when you want to have it precise, but you don't need to worry about that in the beginning. This is, I'm creating the template, and the second part is what's important, not the first, with the exception being the cut across the end. So my only concern right now is getting this cut to start parallel to that line. Now... I also have to realize that once I start, I can't start like this and then try to bend it around like that. So I am committed to the angle that my saw already is at. If I need to, I'll set that on there and just give me a, myself a little bit of a feel. So I know that that's approximately 10 degrees. I get that lined up and I start making my cut. I don't do anything else. I just keep following that cut. If I'm off a little bit, which I am, no big deal. No big deal. Come over here and do the same thing. Now, if I'm off a little bit here, so in my head, I'm going to say, okay, I need to lay this over a little bit more. But now this locks. The wrist back here does not change. This is locked. The saw is going to start and continue on that angle. I'm not going to alter that at all. So I'll get it lined up. And then make my cut. I do all the same angle before I switch and do the other. So when it comes to this one, again, can I see that for just a sec, Moosey? Let me have that for just a sec. Grandpa, you see that just for a sec? That one? No. I want that one. I want that one. <laughs> Come on, kid. Work with me. Work with me. Let me let me just borrow this one for a second. Just just for a second. Just for a second. <laughs> yeah, big laugh. Okay, hold it in position. There. Get that set. Thumbs out of the way. Start the cut. Don't make any changes. You're just gonna stay with that angle. I'm pushing and pulling, letting the saw do the job, meaning I'm not altering. I'm just pushing with the web of my hand. The saw is going to go nice and straight. Straight meaning shortest distance from there down to there. I'll come in and I'll do this one as well. Okay. I would go through and do all of those. Then I'm going to do the pin side. Now, this is the, this this is the plum cut that everybody worries about so much. Shoot. Okay. So I'll put my plane on its side. Put that piece in there. Snug that up. Move that back. Now we're going to employ... A uh, dovetail marking knife, and that has a blade in it that matches that blade on that dovetail saw. So I just need to get rid of this fuzz. Set that on there. What the where'd my plane go? Now, you have to position this accurately, so that's where the Sean Chin, com Sean Chin comes in, and I would have my little masking tape trick in there to hold that in place. But with that all taken care of, you set that in place, hold it firmly, take your dovetail marking knife with that sawtooth blade and put it down in there and drag it through. And you do it two or three times. Now, what I would have to do is use the Sean Chin to push that over a little bit in order to get these in the correct spot, and then I would do the other side. Now, 
the advantage of this, what I'm doing, is I'm putting it into a kerf that has no wiggle room. There is no wiggle room. So when I drag that through, there's no way that blade went to the left or to the right. It continued this cut right down into the next board, leaving a very distinct mark. Now, my next move would be to come in here and carry these lines to the bottom. I don't have a gauge line on there, but if I did. Okay, get that in position. Make sure it's standing plumb. Again, every time your board goes in there, if it's standing plumb, it reinforces in your hand and your head where plumb is. Why does that not look plumb? It is. Now what we used to have to do was follow a knife line. You'd have a knife mark in there and you'd come in here and you're, you're paying attention to this at the same time you're paying attention to that. But with this technique, you simply push the saw into there. I no longer have to worry about that top line. So all I have to do now is just eyeball that line down below and follow it carefully. So I push the saw into the kerf, forget about the top cut, and just focus on the bottom one. And with all my attention being on where that saw is going in relation to that line, it doesn't take very long before you get it. So that's how you make a straight cut. Start off with a good saw, and then follow a good technique, and you got it. Next frick. And I'll be getting a haircut soon, because uh, there's going to be a change in our government. Sure. Uh, Chris McCoy in the chat. What are the pros and cons between a folded back and a milled back? Well, I, I read, I've read a lot about it, and I don't believe any of what I read. Uh, they talk about putting the blade in tension. I say poo-poo on that. Here's why I say that. You, uh, you take your dovetail saw. You mark everything out. You go in. You make the cut. And then here's what this guy does the first time he'd ever cut a dovetail. You take a look at that and tell me whether or not it could be improved upon if his saw held a blade in tension. Here's the guy over here, Justin. I think, I think it is a perfect dovetail. I couldn't fault any of it. Here's a dovetail over here, Omar. Guy's blown up severely by a, an IED. Uh, one leg gone, parts of both arms and hands gone, most of his other leg gone, and the guy was able to pull that off. So don't tell me that a, a tension in the blade as a result of a folded back makes any difference whatsoever. Don't believe it. My opinion. I want to throw my, one, one more thing in on the, uh, on the sauce as it comes to, uh, to ripping. Because a lot of people have a hard time, hard time making a rip cut and keeping it straight. Same principle applies. And that principle is minimal, minimal set. So... Once you start the cut, as long as your set is minimal, the saw, I could close my eyes and do this, the saw is going to cut nice and straight. Now I'm not twisting the saw or pushing it one way or the other. Let the saw do the work. If the set is correct, you'll end up with a nice straight cut. Okay, next Frick. Uh, Aaron Probus in Oakland, California. Hey, Aaron. What are the main factors for sawing dovetails fast like I see you do? Fast? Yeah, basically what allows you to cut dovetails fast? Um, like practice. Might not want to have heard that, but... You know, I, you always hear people, well, 
I hear a lot of opinions that cutting dovetails is all about practice. That's not true. Jake, how much time, how much practice did Brent have before he pulled that off? <laughs> yeah, that bad example. <laughs> okay, how about Justin? It was the first dovetail he did, so I would say it was, it was done within five hours yeah. of start. Okay, you can't practice enough in five hours when you're learning something for the first time to make, to produce something like that. Once you, once you have the right equipment, yeah, people say, oh, yeah, you're just selling tools. Well, take it whatever way you want. I stand here, and I show you how to do it with my tools, and I teach people, and they do that with my tools. There has to be something to the tools. Once you have the right tools and you understand the technique, meaning you know, what, you know the steps, the ABCs, now what practice is going to do for you is going to get you faster. Instead of sitting there and and uh, wrestling with the angle, I, I can get to a point where I can go in and I can make those cuts without really thinking about it and check the angles and they're probably going to be right because I've done it so much. So that's where, that's where practice comes to bear. You'll get faster at it and you'll get faster and still remain accurate. But if I'm, if I'm doing something that's really important, I'll slow down and I'll make sure that it's precise. But if I'm cranking out dovetails for a utility piece, I can do them pretty quick. So you just got to put the hours in on that one. Next for it. Any more vets, Jake? No. Rick? Uh, this is from Chris in Wisconsin. Hey, Chris. What is your opinion on tapered dovetail saws? Yeah, that's, I love that question. Um, trying to uh, answer that without being terribly critical. I'll, I'll, I'm just going to refer back to what I said. That saw has no taper in it. Enabled, well, you've got five examples here. Uh, I'm pretty sure Marshall, that was the first dovetail he'd ever cut. I know Phillips, Philip Gustin, that was the first dovetail he ever cut. I know Omar, that was the first he ever cut. I know for a fact, because I was there, first one Brent ever cut. And I think Justin may have done a couple at home. I'm not 100% sure. So there's five examples of guys who cut near-perfect dovetails the first time. So that saw did it. If you put a little taper in the blade, do you think it's going to make any difference? I personally believe that any taper in a dovetail saw came from just filing over the years and applying a little more pressure at one end than the other. I don't think it had anything to do with performance. And I've read some really hard to swallow stories about what it does. It's just, it's like using an angled shooting board. Supposedly, it's to uh, save your blade or make it an easier cut. The amount that you can actually change in cutting and in, in shooting, I know I'm a little bit off topic here, but if I'm shooting the edge of this board and I have a slope like that introduced to it, well, that's changing maybe a quarter of an inch difference in the blade. I can sharpen a blade in 32 seconds. Why am I worrying about making an angled shooting board to uh, gain one one hundredth of an extra amount of time and the sharpness of the blade, because instead of using five-eighths of the blade to make this cut, I'm now using seven-eighths of the blade to make that cut. Actually, it wouldn't be seven-eighths. It would be, yeah, it would be seven-eighths. It doesn't make any sense. So I, I, don't give it any, uh, I don't give it any weight at all. Again, my opinion, you asked. I gave it to you. Next, Frick. Uh, Peter Rosa in Oceanside. <clears throat> Hi, Peter. I built a 24-inch. Oceanside, inch California. I built a 24-inch shooting board following your instructions on YouTube, but it cupped after two years. Why did this happen? I'm sorry. Oh, is it cupped after two years? Yep. And it's tw oh, 24 inches long, and it cupped on them. Um, I don't know what you made it out of. I'm assuming if you followed, did my mind, you made it out of uh, plywood and, and uh, MDF. Uh, ocean, you're, on a, you're in a humid environment. Don't know. Uh, well, all I would say is if you're going to make another one, add more curve to it. That would be, uh, that would be, the, that would be the only advice that I could give you. I, we, in our shop, we control the humidity. So 
we don't get those wild swings. And if you don't do that, I would suggest you might want to consider it. If you, can if you maintain the humidity in your shop the same year round, then things shouldn't change, right? So control the humidity, add, introduce a little more curve. And if you, use, if, you've got, if you make a shooting board and you get two or three years out of it before you wear it out, you're probably doing quite well. That's assuming you're using it a fair bit. Next, Rick. Uh, Lynx from Barbados. Lynx? Well, that's a online name. No, I think from that's Barbados. actually his first name. Nice and warm. I if, if I could only afford one back saw, which one of yours should I buy? Dovetail. The dovetail saw, the regular dovetail saw, on sale right now, 15% off. Um, I'll give you the little specs on it real quick. It has, um, well, you know the type of tooth count, 22 TPI up here, 22 TPI, I'm sorry, 22 teeth per inch for the first two inches, 15 teeth per inch for the balance, so it'll cut quite quick. It gives you an inch and five-eighths of an inch, one and five-eighths inch depth of cut. The blade is 10 inches long. Uh, the saw weighs, I think, about 22 ounces. Pretty hefty saw. Brass back is 7 eighths of an inch by quarter. And it feels really nice in the hand. That's be the one. That's the one that I use the most. I probably use that. Uh, of the time that I'm using a handsaw, that probably would get 85% um, use. Next, Rick. Uh, Mickey Knowles in the chat. Hi, Mickey. Since you studied under Sam Maloof, can you tell me if Sam used back saws? Um, I was I I worked as Sam's assistant. Don't don't misinterpret me. Uh, in uh, 1987, when he taught at Anderson Ranch, so uh, I, I didn't apprentice. I just worked as his assistant. And did he use back saws? Oh, I'm trying to remember. <coughs> you know what? I can't. Re I don't recall. I'm assuming he did. His dovetails have a lot of slope on them, more than I would like. He's probably about a one in five, might even be a one in four. And I'm going to, I'm going to bet that he used a, a regular dovetail saw, but, but I can't say for sure. Sorry. Next, Rick. We run another questions. No. You just trying. To uh, Harold like? followed up to his question about the Scandinavian Jake, saws. Jake, he's going to fall off. Say, say that again, please. Harold's question earlier about the Scandinavian saws. He said, I did not mean uh, back saws. I was referring to saw manufacturers like Bacho and Sandvik. Oh. Um, my, all I can say about that is, as far, nothing. I mean, I've used Sandvik. Nothing special. Uh, I don't think they stand out as being anything. I, where do you get by a really good panel? That's why we made panel saws, because we use them in the, when we teach the class. And uh, Lee Nielsen stopped making them. And uh, one of the other companies that make them, the waiting the time was ridiculous. So I just said to Jake one day, I said, we need, to make, we need to have a panel saw. So we went to work on it, and it took us probably two or three years to eventually bring them to market. So there isn't anything, there isn't any, neither of those two brands trigger anything me that says, yeah, I need one, I want one of those. You got to remember the problem is this. How many people do you know use something like this professionally? You probably don't know any. And because of that, there's no professional demand, there's no professional supply. So you got little boutique makers like us who produce, how many of those would we do in a year? Yeah, so we've made 400. Uh, I think we might have made a few more than that. I was going to say 500. But that's th that kind of those kind of numbers wouldn't turn a big company on, so I understand why they don't produce them. And then the ones that do, I mean, only other, the only other mass-produced ones you're going to find are those ones with the plastic hand, hollow plastic handles and the uh, uh, induction-hardened teeth that are designed to be discarded of when they're dull. So... And they got tons of set. But remember, too, that they, they make their saws for construction wood. 
which is going to have a higher moisture content, which is going to have a tendency to close on the saw blade. We're dealing with uh, appropriately dried furniture grade wood. So that's we uh, that was our intent when we made this saw. Have narrow set for that purpose, and it would cut nice and straight. So as far as those two brands go, I can't comment other than what I said. Next, Frick. Uh, Justin in the chat is asking, how hey, often should a so, blah, how often should a saw be sharpened? A saw should be sharpened as often as it needs to be, and I apologize for that answer, but that's like saying, how often do you fill your gas tank? Well, whenever I'm out of gas, how often I sharpen my skates? Well, when they no longer bite the ice. So if your saw, uh, you can you can tell the difference. Now, here, let me give you a few more clues. So a sharp saw, when you run your teeth, your fingers over like that, there's no sliding of your teeth, of your fingers. It bites. You can feel it. It's really crisp. Uh, when you're sawing, and if you seem like you're pushing and it's just not going very fast, obviously it's time to, it's time to uh, sharpen the saw. Dovetail saws can go a long time just because if you add up the number of feet of wood that's been cut, when you do a dovetail, it's pretty minimal. So it'll, that'll go a long time. Um, I would tell people, I typically tell people, if you're cutting dovetails every month, you're going to get three to five years between sharpenings. Next, Rick. Uh, Michael Dodo in the chat. Hi, Michael. Please explain hang angle and how important it is. Well, so when you hold the saw... Uh, the angle that the blade is meeting the wood when, you, it, when you're holding the saw. In other words, this in relation to the tooth line. And did I pay attention to it? I don't pay attention to that stuff. I do what, it, what feels comfortable. So instead of following somebody's rule, it's like when I build a box, I'm veering a little bit. I don't measure. When I made this box, I said, well, I want something about this long and about this wide feels good and about that tall and that's what i come up with that's why if you measure one of my boxes you'll probably get some oh that's six and three quarter by two and nine sixteenths by three and a shy quarter i don't measure things like that so when it came to making this saw we just worked with it until it felt good and it just felt right and measure it that's what it is but there are people that pay t that follow all these rules and sometimes it's like well who's to say that guy was right maybe he had short arms maybe he had weird wrists <laughs> well, whatever no but if you if you made yours and yours was a 20 degree hang angle and somebody was using yours and they found that they didn't like it it would be nice to know that they didn't like the 20 degree well, that's why, that's why, okay, so we, when, when we were doing this, we were trying to get it so that when I held it like that, the tooth line followed my arm. It wasn't back like that, and it wasn't up like that. It was, it was just comfortable, and it's, it, it felt like, well, that's the way, where it should be. And when we use it, it feels comfortable. So if you use it and it doesn't feel comfortable, I don't know what you're going to do. But well. I, don't pay, I don't pay any attention to that. I just, you know, it's... Frick, can you ask the question again, please? Please explain the hang angle and how important it is. Did we? You didn't explain what it is. I you did. I said it's a relation. It, 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 it's, it's this compared to this. All right? So when you're holding this off, where's the tooth line? So I said, I didn't, I didn't follow any formula. I just messed with it until it felt comfortable. When I'm sawing, it felt like that's where it should be. Now, how can I do that? Well, I've got enough experience of doing this that, you know, uh, I can, the other day, I turn a lot of handles for chisels. I turn all the handles. We just had Kip Christensen here, and he taught the guys. So Rick had turned one of, had turned one, a handle, and he put it in with a pile of 26 that I had given him. And he said, I, I, well, I put one in there. And I looked, and I picked up two, and sure enough, one of the two was one that he did. How do I see that? Well, anything you do a lot of, you'll get to the point where you can see the tiniest detail that somebody else would look at and say, how did you see that? So when I do this, 
you can borrow my experience, benefit from my experience. I know what feels right. That's why I tell people this thing about folded back versus a cut, a solid back with a slot cut in it doesn't make any difference, none whatsoever. If it did, I wouldn't be able to. People wouldn't be able to produce this. Oh, a little pet peeve, you could say. Next, Rick. Good question, though. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, I can't read this guy's name. Danny Bell. D Bell. <laughs> In the chat. He's in the chat. He says, what tips do you Would have? Would that be the, uh, the, the D-Bell that we know? Obviously. Night Stalker, Danny Bell? The man. <laughs> 160th? What tips do you have for cutting a thin piece of wood for box blinds? Pardon? What tips do you have for cutting a thin piece of wood for box blinds? Oh, so what Danny is asking about, I assume, is this. So when I make these boxes, I make the saw cut uh, with a dovetail saw, and then I s make a piece of ebony veneer and slip, slip it in there. So that veneer has to be 24 thousandths of an inch thick. So Dan, what I do is I go over to the table saw, and I cut, I'll show you. Can we do it here, Jake? Uh, I'll show you a couple little tips that I do. All right, turn this on. So the first thing I'm going to do is get that edge parallel to that edge. Then I'll come over here and shoot it. So now it's nice and clean. Even though it isn't, I went the wrong direction. Then I'm going to get a piece of tape. I'm going to put a piece of tape on this. I'm going to move this over. And I would get my, my calipers, and that's too thick. Still too thick. Can't make that cut very long, because that, that won't stay put. Keep moving that over. That's good. Okay. That's just the time. And I'm gonna go a little bit more. Now I'm gonna cut this off, and that piece of masking tape is gonna allow me to pull that over. In other words, it'll get sucked down the hole. Now I've got a piece of uh, MDF. And I've got sandpaper on it. I'm going to do another shameless promotion. If you've got to use sandpaper, you want to use this stuff. We now sell this. This is Porter Cable. And this guy, it's adhesive backed, so it sticks there. The problem with trying to plane a uh, little thin piece of wood like this is you, certainly, you can't plane it up against something because it will... It will fold on you. So instead... You can clean off that little nib too. Yeah. I'll put it... Put the block in like this. Get my calipers. <coughs> and check this. So that's coming in at 40... 43 thou. So I should have made that a lot thinner before I did, but I didn't. So I'll just go ahead. So I'm going to come in here and just get rid of that little piece from the saw. I 
think it's going to be cleaner this way. So I'm going to use my plane, throat down tight. Light cut. Oh, that's way too heavy of a cut. Now, I don't want to hit the sandpaper. So I'm making sure that I have my weight properly balanced. So I'm on the wood. And when I finish, I'm pushing down here. So I'm still on the wood. My sole of my plane is not touching the sandpaper. But the, sandpa the sandpaper keeps the board, the piece of wood from moving on me. Check that. 32 thou. Now, when I get close, I'm actually going to check it with the kerf. So I'm going to take two more off. You're also going to find out if your uh, blade is not parallel to your sole. You're going to be thinner on one side than the other, and I think that's the case here. Okay, so that's 26 thou. If I turn it this way, okay, that wouldn't no, make any difference. That's 26 thou. No, it is. That's 20, 20. One thou. So my blade was a little bit parallel. I should have discovered that sooner. So what I got to go in there and I got to tap that blade over. But I would just keep doing that until that fits in. Here's a uh, saw curve. That should fit like a wedge right now. Flip it around. <laughs> That's thicker at the top. So you just got to do what I just did. Only check to make sure you're playing. The blade is parallel to the sole, so you're taking the same amount off both sides each time you make a pass. And that's how I did it with the uh, ebony. A little easier with the ebony. It's a little bit stiffer, but you can do it with just about anything if you follow that plan. Next question, Frick. Um, Steve in San Diego. Hi, Steve. Says, why do you need a bench crosscut and a joinery crosscut saw? Why do you need a bench crosscut and a joinery crosscut? Well... My joinery crosscut is something that I use to, to literally be able to join from the cut. So I'm doing a, uh, I'm doing a uh, cutting on the shoulder on the tenon. I want to be able to come in and make a cut that is precise enough. that when I bring another piece of wood up to it, I get a perfect fit. Nice and clean, don't have to do anything with the chisel. So, if that's the case, then I need to keep, I wanna keep that pristine. If, I'm, if I don't wanna to have to run across the other room to use the chop saw, and I've gotta cut the end off of a piece of wood, rather than use that, I'll use my bench hook and grab my bench cross cut, whatever I did with it, right here. And, I, and it cuts a little bit faster, too. It's a 13 TPI. It's a stiffer blade. It's a little better. It's going to be a little faster cut. If I'm going to cut through something like this. Thicker plate. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get through it a lot faster with this saw than I am with that little one. That's the reason why. Next. Yep. Uh, Mike Evans in Knoxville, Tennessee. Mike. Yep. Is there an advantage to a cross-cut filed tenon saw? Is there an advantage to a cross? No, not at all. And, not in, and in particular, not. <clears throat> if, you think about, if you think about cutting a tenon on something like that and trying to use a cross cut saw on it, you'll be there for a month. That's where you want, that's where you want, uh, that's the advantage of a rip tooth, is you're going to get some speed in that cut. Rip with your rip saw. Cross cut with your cross cut saw. That's why I, I don't use combina I don't use combination blades in the shop. Look, all we all we carry is a uh, a really uh, 24, tooth, 24 tooth rip and an eighty tooth cross cut. I don't use combination teeth combination blades because they're designed to do both jobs so well, so so. So you don't have to buy two blades. Well, I don't mind spending the money to get the performance. So. I, and I, I, I hate having to switch blades, but the way a, uh, an 80 tooth, a sharp 80 tooth cross cut will cut plywood in particular compared to a combination tooth is worth the time. And you can apply that to your hand saws as well. Next, Rick. Bill in London. Oh, he's up late. Is a small cross cut saw really needed at the bench? 
Frick, are you sick? Yes. I can hear it. Is a small crosscut saw really needed? At the bench. At the bench? Yeah. Um, I suppose you could say nothing's really needed. You could, you could make the cut, cut with a dovetail saw. But I'll tell you this story. I was, uh, I was doing... There used to be a uh, wood show called uh, Handworks. No. What was it called, Jake? Do you remember? Anyway, it was, in, it was in Cincinnati. Popular Woodworking Magazine used to put it on. Oh, and I was there. That wasn't Woodworking in America, was it? Hmm? Wood, yeah, Woodworking, woodworking in America. America. I was there in the, working in the booth for Woodcraft. And Frank Klaus came along. He, he was with a guest speaker. And uh, I just stood back. I, I recognized him. I, I stood back, and he picked up my crosscut saw. And uh, we had some wood there for people to try. Put his glasses on. He probably wouldn't have been the same age then as I am now. And he came over, and he made a cut. And he looked at the saw, and he made another cut. Looked at the saw again, kind of yeah, gave it once over, and he left. And about 15 minutes, 20 minutes later, he came back. And he came right back to the same piece of wood that hadn't changed. And he picked up the saw again. And he came in. And he made another cut. And he made another cut. He may have made three. I don't remember. And he said, under his breath, but I heard it, he said, that is the smoothest cutting crosscut saw I've ever used. I was there. I heard it. So... That's the smoothest, cut, smoothest cutting crosscut saw I've ever used. We designed it that way. It works beautifully. You will not find a crosscut saw. I used to represent another company, and their, their small crosscut saw was the most problematic saw we had. They could never get the saw set right, and it just was, it was just lousy. It just really was. Couldn't sell it with confidence. So we went out. And said, you know, let's make a good one. And I think we did. I think, we have, I think it's, I think our crosscut, that joinery crosscut saw is better than any other crosscut saw out there. More so than our dovetail saw is better than the other dovetail saws out there. And we have people rave about that. So I guess we're doing something right. Next, Frick. Greta. Greta what? Questions. Luther's making some up and I haven't got them yet. He's making them up? Yeah. You mean out of his head? Yeah. Oh. Well. If there's any more in the chat, please let us know. How many people do we have on tonight? Uh, almost 400. That's good. Well, here's one. I'm using your saw and your methods, but my dovetails are always way too tight. Okay. Well, uh, if you're using my method, then you're using the Sean Shim. Big shout out to Sean McDermott who uh, came up with the idea for the Sean Shim. We turned it into a product, named it after him, pay him a royalty on him. And if your dovetails are too tight, you just have to understand how this thing works. So, shoot, I really need two clean pieces of wood. Let me, uh, can you hear me talk if I go, I'm just going to run down there and grab a couple pieces of Possibly. wood. Everybody hit that like button while you're waiting. Thanks, Michael Dodo, for the suggestion. So, you need to understand how this works. And it uh, made me, every uh, once in a while, have to stop and rethink it. Once you do this, it. Yeah. Gary Nellis wants you to demonstrate cutting a tenon. Um, might not have time to do that tonight. Well, not make oh, just, uh, just uh, okay, okay, and basically, how to follow your layout lines. 
Okay, so I'm just going to uh, quickly rough this out. So there's our, there's our dovetail. This is going to be the pin. So we lay that out. Now, just so that you can see the whole process and understand it, um, tape. Four layers of tape on the underside of the dovetail just crossing over the line enough so that it'll register. Now, trim that on the sides I'm out. so that it won't interfere. Whoa, what the frank smells like vinegar? Hope nothing goes wrong. They both left me. Now, cut through that and then peel off that little piece. So now I've got that little wall. So with my plane on its side, put this piece in, get it flush with the top. Set that back. Okay. So, my saw kerf is 24 thousandths of an inch. So, I'm going to take the 24 thou. I'm going to flip it over like this. There's the offset. And doing it, holding it like that, and I push this up against it, I now have the thickness of the saw blade right there. So, if I bake my, take my dovetail marking knife and put it through right there, that should leave me with a piece over here to fill this void when this piece gets cut off that will fill it perfectly. However, if I make this a little bit bigger, and to do that, I would go 25 thou. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna push that over an extra thousandth of an inch. That'll end up resulting in this half pin that's gonna fill this void is gonna be a thousandth of an inch bigger. This piece in here is going to be two thousandths of an inch bigger because you're going to gain, you're going to gain a thousandth of an inch on this side and a thousandth of an inch on that side. That'll make for a tighter joint. If I want to go a little bit less, then I'm going to go 23 thou. And 23 thou means I'm going to take a thousandth of an inch off of this half pin and it'll be one thou less than it would have been otherwise. This will be two thou less than. So if you're pins are ending up too tight, if you drop down to 23, then that should make this, that'll relax the fit a little bit for what goes in here, and obviously what goes in here, here, and here. Right? So I always found that if I just focus on right here, that's, easiest, that's the easiest way to figure out, okay, which way do I need to go in order to make the joint tighter? Which way do I need to go in order to make the joint a little loose? And that's why we give you the uh, four different options on your Sean Chim. Okay. That should help. Okay, now the question was cutting, can laying you, out and cutting can you a ask ten. That Gary can you show how to saw a tenon and follow your layout lines? Yeah. So I'm going to use my mortising gauge mm. over okay, there. Just, no just continue talking. I'll go grab it. Okay. You got your wood right there on the drill press. What? Oh, you brought me over a piece. So I always, I always, uh, I always chop the mortise first because it's easier to adjust the tenon than it is to adjust the mortise. So assuming that I've already gone in and, and uh, chopped my tenon, my mortise, then I'm going to take my marking gauge, my marking gauge, and I'm going to determine... 
I would have already done this in the layout, but I'm determining how deep I can go into this piece, which other words means how long can my tenon be. So I will come in and I, I make sure that I cut this really deep. And across the end, watch out for your thumb because it's uh, it won't cut very deep, but it'll sure cut if you happen to slip. So I've got a really good gauge line. So we shouldn't let Frick use that one either. No. Uh. Set this in place. Now I would take my mortise <coughs> chisel, match it up. I'm going to just use this one because it's the one I grabbed. So this is a mortise and gauge that uh, my good friend and, and genius Paul up in Ontario helped us develop. You set that in there like so, and you... Back this off enough so it allows me. Screw that outside cutter until it squeezes. It squeezes the chisel between the two, and then lock that in place. Right now, I'm going to center this so I eyeball it. And what I do to check it is I push it down like that and make two little marks, flip it over from the other side, and it looks really good. Now, drag that across the end slowly, or lightly, I should say, not slowly. Because otherwise, if you try to do it too hard, too quick, those little uh, cutters may wander because they cancel each other out, unlike a normal marking gauge. But if you just keep going a little deeper each time, you eventually get a pretty good line. And then go down the face, or the edge, and go down the edge. Okay. Now, if you're new to this, and you want a way of doing it even faster, or not faster, easier, then take your sharp chisel, and this is assuming that you've gone in and, uh, and made that line really deep. Using a sharp chisel, I'm gonna come in, and I'm going to cut a little trough right there, like that. Now that little trough, I, can, I could use my dovetail saw on this, or I can use my tenon. I got my tenon right here. I can come in here like so. This is your medium tenon. Yeah, it's my medium tenon. Put that in there, and by doing that, you see how it gives me a little wall? Now there's no, I don't have to worry about trying to follow anything. I've got a little wall right there, and I'm gonna start that cut. But before I get too deep, all I wanna do is just get the kerf established across the end. Then what I'll do is I, this is, this is like marking the end of the tails with the dovetail marking knife. You set the saw in there, in there and you no longer have to worry about that. You only have to worry about coming down the face. So with this established... Would you put the piece on an angle? Uh, depends. Now I can pay attention to this line on the side. And I'll follow this all the way down. Now, if you're doing something really small like this, what will happen sometimes is that that piece will have a tendency, because it's thin, to lay out like that. And in doing that, it'll allow the saw to wander, and, and it won't stay true. So I put in a piece behind it, which helps to hold that. It, what it does, it forces your saw to track better. Once I get to the bottom here, then I can kind of cut while raising the saw up until it's level. Don't cut below. And then this would just be a repeat of that. I would go in and make that cut so that you have that nice little wall to work against. Which makes it so easy. Now, when it comes to cutting off this piece, I'm going to use a bench hook. But again, I'll come in, in the waist, and I'll cut a trough. Now this is where I would grab my joinery cross cut. Come in here like this, clean those the sawdust off. Lay that in there.
<laughs> got to get a nice plum cut. I mean, your saw's got to be standing plumb. I didn't, I didn't make that saw cut deep enough. So my next move would be I'd come in here and lay my chisel against that cheek and just finish that cut that I should have done with the saw, but I wasn't paying close enough attention. Then from this side, so I have lots of control, I'll set my chisel in there and just finish that cut. Now, if I see, if I see the marking gauge line and a little lip above it, then I know I have to set my chisel in the marking gauge line and clean that up. But that saw cut nice and clean. See that? There's no ridge left there. So I should be able to join right to that. So combination of sharp tools and some good technique. And you should be able to make perfect cuts. Anything else? You want to mention our new uh, venture coming up here? Uh, yeah, we have a new website. It's called Rob it's Cosman Woodworks. RobCosmanWoodworks.com. RobCosmanWoodworks.com. I'm getting back into the game. I'm going to be making boxes. I'm going to be making custom chisel handles out of really nice wood. I'm going to be doing some, you'll be able to buy my custom saws with the fancy doodah handles. And uh, some other stuff. I, I miss, I miss the woodworking part and selling it. Now that may sound a little bit weird, but it was always such a thrill that somebody would walk into a gallery and buy something that I designed and built. They didn't know you; they just liked it. And it was all—I don't know whether it was. Uh, what's the word, Frick? How would you describe that? Mm. Oh, come on, you're the English major. Why do you think we have you here? Because <laughs> I'm the tech guru. Um, it, validates, it validates who you are as a woodworker, maybe. Anyway, watch for it. We'll release it here soon. We almost had it ready to go today. but So the website's on the screen right now. If you go to it now, you can enter your email address so you uh, get notified when it launches. And it's, it should launch this week uh, with just the boxes on it first, but... They're all one-off boxes handmade by Rob. So each box that's listed, that's the only one. And when you purchase it, it's sold yeah, out. There's, so. there's the, the serial numbers on each box, and it's yeah. shown in the picture. And Rob signs each one on the bottom with a, what is it, a heat, wood-burning yes. pen? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Are we giving away stuff tonight? Uh, yeah. We have over $1,000 in donations. Uh, Luther, if you can put the update in the chat exactly, and I'm just going to get all the names here. Give your little blurb or whatever. Okay, we got to give away some dead cats. What's my little blurb? This is what we do to help support. This is our, our primary fundraiser for our Purple Heart Project. So next year, starting in April, we have six classes, April, May, June, July, September, and October. We will bring a total of 42 combat wounded veterans, vets in. In the last two years, we've had them from, uh, from Australia, from Ireland, from Denmark, from the United States mostly, and from Canada. So uh, if you know anybody who is combat wounded, whether it's a physical wound or a mental wound, have them go to our uh, website, robcosman.com, and you can see there's a place right on there under Purple Heart Project, and they can go in there and they can... Fill out the application, send it in, and uh, Jake and I and uh, Luther uh, go through and through a point system and then some chit chat. We decide uh, who we're who who gets the seat, and we only get three or four applicants for each seat. So it's not like you're uh, one in a million. You may be one in a million, but you're not one in a million when it comes to uh, getting a spot in our in our class. We cover airfare. We house you, we feed you well. We send you home with, in U.S. dollars, approximately $4,000 worth of premium tools. And thanks to, uh, thanks to Jack Lane and, uh, and uh, Jim Rossetti up here in Canada and a, a host of Bench Brigade volunteers, you, you heard about some of them tonight. We uh, have them build a bench to our standard 
and deliver it to your home so that you'll have a bench, your bench to work on. I also have to say hi to Angie tonight. I almost forgot. Angie and Lynn, have the t-shirts arrived? No, they're down there. We got a, we got a big shipment of uh, Purple Heart t-shirts that you can get in time for Christmas. All three colors. Navy, Angie's color, which is kind of a... Um, I don't have one up there. Oh, yeah, I do it right here, Jake. Oh, yeah. That turquoise. Well, all three of them were in the shot. And uh, the green... And Angie and Lynn package them all up. They do a beautiful job. It's the most professionally packaged thing that we have, we carry. So, Angie, you're, uh, you're going to be busy real soon. Jake should have them hurry this week. Big thank you to Ken. Uh, we had, and big thanks to Kip Christensen, who we had here for a week, training uh, six of our guys on using the lathe to, uh, to turn handles. And it was a great time having him here, and he's... Awesome teacher, instructor, and an incredible craftsman as well. Okay, Frick, you ready? Uh, yep, just one sec. So what are we going to give away? Uh, should we give away a panel saw? We raised almost $1,500. Fifteen. We had to have 2000 in order to get, give away two prizes. If something happens between now and the next 10 seconds, we'll bump it up. So uh, we always give away three dead cats, compliments of moose, and uh, they'll keep everybody warm. So let's give those away first, and then we'll give, and then we'll do a draw for uh, a panel saw. All right. So we'll the three dead cats. Cross cut or rip, Jake. Do a rip. Cut. All right. Here we go. First dead cat sweater. I draw all three at once. Do you? First one goes to Bob Stevens in Denver, Colorado. Hey, Bob, you will be happy in Denver with this. Next one. Next one goes to Mark Patterson in Roseville, California. Mark, where's Roseville? Hey, that's where, uh, you know, yeah. What was his name, Frank? Mark, Mark Patterson. Mark Patterson. That's that's far enough north. You'll you'll really enjoy it too, Mark. And the third one. And the third one goes to Todd Wilson in Queensland, Australia. My nephew, my nephew um, Carter, just got his mission call to uh, Roseville, California. So you see, you see a guy with. Curly blonde hair around with the last name Cosman on there. Be nice to him. Well, where's the last one going? Off Queensland, Australia? Yep. They are just entering summer, but it'll still be well received. Okay, so now we're going to give away a uh, one of our new rip cross cut, uh, rip uh, panel saws like this. Beautiful saw. Big thanks to Chris Davenport, who has been helping us. Uh, can we give him an update on the planes, Jake? No. So I can't give you an update on the plane that we're making, the five and a half, called the Super Five and a Half. And I can't tell you that we found a local machinist that most likely is going to be doing it, and stay tuned. Okay, All Frank, right. who are we giving it to? Winner of the saw. Drum roll. John Diekman in Wisconsin. John in Wisconsin, congratulations. Contact us, and uh, Gina will put that in the mail for you on Monday. You'll love it. So we are on again before Christmas, right? Yep. Yeah, we've got a... Uh, Two weeks from tonight. We have a uh, charity venture that we're uh, helping out. It's for uh, a fellow sawmaker who has um, uh, some serious health issues. And this is, uh, this is uh, a kit of tools that's been donated and being auctioned off, I think. I think it is being auctioned off. I'll get tuned up on that. I raffled. Just, raffled off. And all the proceeds are going, and it's going to be done through, through, it's going to be done through GoFundMe, and all the proceeds are going to his wife and children, which is a great cause. So we will, we'll have them, we'll have the chap who's doing it on live with us next time. And I also want to have, um, who's our bench brigade builder we talked about earlier? Jamie Fagel. On as well to tell you about the Bench Brigade. And I'll get Jack on there too. All right, we'll see you. And I should be able to see you in a couple of weeks, Frick? Yeah, I'm sure two weeks. Two weeks. Have a, uh, I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving, for those of you in the U.S. And uh, tis the season. Start singing your carols and putting up your Christmas tree and remember the reason for the season. See you in two weeks. Thank you. <laughs>